Come to think of it, space-time is the real thing. Space and time individually? Well, those are just observational artifacts. Bro, what are you talking about, man? We shall get to that, but first, welcome to Physics Next Book. We are currently creating a video series where we identify, let's just say, the confusing but very basic aspects of spatial relativity and try to clarify them. Today's topic is space-time versus space and time. We think of space and time as two very fundamental aspects of existence. Space is the arena where it all happens and time is a parameter that keeps track of the sequence of these happenings. To give a dumb analogy, think of space as the pages in a storybook and time is the page number. Usually, we first encounter the idea of space and time from the perspective of a physicist or in a mathematical sense in context of studying, let's say, a particle's motion, for example. The end goal there is to predict the path the particle is going to take. We need to calculate and predict this path, you know, the position of the particle in space as a function of time. We need to calculate this function because we cannot move back and forth in time to see how it has moved in the past or how it is going to move in the future as we can do in space. This makes time very very distinctive from space. In a sense, the whole methodology of physics is structured to get around this inability of ours to see into the future. All we want to figure out is how an atom or an electric field or a gravitational field, you get the point, any system whatsoever evolves in time. In the pre-special relativistic era, time was thought to have an absolute or objective flow. Same for all kinds of observers. In contrast, coordinates of an object that indicate where it is in space have always been totally subjective. They depend on who is observing, how the coordinate system has been laid, where its origin is, etc. In short, space coordinates change as the reference frame used by the observer changes, but time coordinate does not. And then along came Einstein with his postulates of spatial relativity and told us that flow of time does change as the observer changes frames. Though this effect only shows up if the relative velocity between the two frames is extremely high. By the way, two frames of reference are distinguished by their relative velocity only. We have discussed this extensively in some earlier videos that you can find in the i button and also in the description. Anyway, this new development meant one has to transform time coordinates too, along with the spatial coordinates when shifting from one reference frame to another. The most famous is of course Lorentz transformation that relates space and time coordinates of two inertial frames. When we reach up to this point in our relativity lessons, we see that space and time transform together and further we are introduced to the machineries of tensor calculus and shown how nicely everything works out if we think of them together as a single entity to be named the space-time coordinates. The saying goes like treating space and time coordinates on equal footing, etc. And we are convinced. Sounds familiar? It should if you have ever taken a relativity course. But is it only a matter of mathematical convenience to put space and time together? Or is space-time as a single entity or concept closer to objective physical reality than space and time individually are? To answer this question, we need to look at the idea of a space-time interval between a pair of events and how it looks from the perspective of different observers. When observers in different inertial frames measure the space-time interval between the given pair of events, they get a unique value. In technical lingo, this is called the invariance of space-time interval and we have a video on how this can be proved. If you are watching this video, you probably know very well that this invariance is exclusive to inertial frames only. But a less realized subtlety is that this criteria of inertial frames is needed only if the two events under consideration are at a finite separation in space-time. However, if they are infinitesimally close to each other, then this criteria can be slightly relaxed and the invariance actually works between an inertial frame and a non-inertial frame as well. This has been discussed in an earlier video, so let us not repeat it here. Check out the link in the i button and also in the description if you need to. So, in this video, we shall talk in terms of infinitesimal space-time intervals so that a more generic scenario including the non-uniform motion can also be covered. Let us consider the trajectory or world line of an arbitrarily moving particle. By arbitrarily moving, we of course mean its motion can be uniform or non-uniform or a combination of both. Since the particle is a material body, 
so its speed at all points on its trajectory is less than the speed of light and therefore tangents drawn at any point of the world line must lie within the light cone at that point. So world line of the particle is a time-like curve and all infinitesimal segments of the world line are time-like intervals. Let us say we are observers in the inertial frame S0. We always are, at least when we are discussing relativity. If we take two infinitesimally close events on this world line, we have a infinitesimal space-time interval, which is, as we just discussed, time-like. Now it better looks like a straight line. Why? Because this interval is so small that the slope of the world line, or in other words, the velocity of the particle does not change while crossing this tiny interval, even though the particle's overall motion may be non-uniform. Let's zoom in a little bit so we can look at it easily. Now, if we, the a zero frame observers, care to measure, this infinitesimal space-time interval will appear to be made of a certain combination of spatial and temporal pieces. Let us stop for a moment to think how we identify the spatial and temporal parts of this space-time interval. We draw lines parallel to our space axis at the two ends of this space-time interval and measure along our time axis how far apart these parallel lines are. That gives us the temporal piece. Then we repeat the same process with lines parallel to our time axis. And this gives us the spatial part. But what if an observer in some other inertial frame, let's say S1, carries out the same measurements? If we look at the space-time diagram he draws in his reference frame, it will look exactly like ours. Only the coordinate levels will be different, say x primed and t primed, just to distinguish it from our x and t, and the slope of the space-time segment will be slightly different. That doesn't reveal much. A lot more illuminating will be if we draw the space and time axis of S1 frame as it appears in our space-time diagram. How we do this, I have elaborated in my last video on the Twin Paradox, hope you have watched it. If not, it is just only a clicks away in the I button. Ok, now to measure the spatial and temporal component for the same infinitesimal space-time interval, the S1 frame observer follows the same principle as we have done, but uses his space and time axis instead of ours, of course. He draws lines parallel to his space axis at the two ends of the space-time interval to measure how far apart these parallel lines are along his time axis, that's the temporal piece as seen from S1 frame, and similarly he can also get the spatial piece. You can see the pieces he has got are very different from what we get. Since the reference axes are different, this is obvious. But notice that the space-time interval is what it is. It remains the same in shape, size, orientation, irrespective of which observer is measuring and from which frame. So the actual physical thing is the whole space-time interval, not its spatial and temporal components individually. Those are just the consequence of us observers' perspective in context of what we can measure. We have encountered this in school-level physics as well. When we express a vector, for example, say a momentum of a particle, we do that by writing down its components so that we can do the math easily. But the momentum vector as a whole is the actual physical thing that follows, say, Newton's second law or law of conservation, etc. Neither these laws nor the momentum vector itself cares about how we observers express it in terms of components from one reference frame or another. It just goes about minding its own business, which is just to follow the laws of nature. The same is true for the space-time interval as well. But let's dig a little deeper. Let's replace the arbitrarily moving particle by an arbitrarily moving observer, a person. He of course is a non-inertial observer in general. But as we have said, we shall be looking at an infinitesimal interval only, so his measurement is as good as us inertial observers. What does he observe from his rest frame perspective? The two infinitesimally close events that we have been considering occur on his world line. Zooming in a little again so that we can see it easily. In his rest frame, say S2, these two events appear to occur spatially at wherever he is. By definition of rest frame, he cannot move spatially at all with respect to S2. See how his movement in space-time is along his time axis only, which is nothing but the local tangent to his world line at every point. So to him, these two events appear to occur at the same spatial coordinate location in S2 frame only his clock kept ticking between the two events. 
so he sees the two events occur one after the other only separated by time so what observers like us in s0 or s1 frame see as a combo pack of spatial length and time elapsed he sees as a pure time duration but so far we have been discussing about time like space time intervals only what about the space like intervals or space like curves these are curves in space time such that tangents drawn at any point on it will fall outside the light cone drawn at that point thus slopes at every point on space like curves represent speeds greater than the speed of light and therefore no material body can move along such curves consider two infinitesimally close events on such a curve the infinitesimal interval between them is space like to get a specific physical example of space like interval let us consider length of a stick which is at rest in our s0 frame so in our space time diagram it will appear to move vertically upwards along our time axis now to find how long the stick is we have to get the space time coordinates of its two endpoints simultaneously and calculate the space time interval between them though it seems a bit pretentious that's the official prescription for calculating length since coordinates of the two endpoints are noted simultaneously the temporal part is zero by prescription here so this space time interval is obviously space like and it looks like a purely spatial segment to us as zero observers for obvious reasons it's just the length right but if the s1 frame observer measures the space time interval between the same two events he does not get a purely spatial segment because he is not measuring the length of the stick here but he is just looking at the same two space time events that we have used to measure the length of the stick we can figure out what he will get if we draw the space time diagram of s1 frame on top of ours like we have done earlier note how the two ends of the stick appear separated in time as well as in space according to the s1 frame guy so the observer in s1 frame sees a combination of spatial length and elapsed time for the same space time interval which appeared as a pure length to us in s0 frame in an earlier video in this channel on types of space time interval we have explained that for any given space like interval there is always one frame where it appears as a spatial length in this example our s0 is that frame so hopefully you are getting the trend right do you understand being time like and space like are characteristics of the space time interval itself and depending on this character the interval may look like pure time or pure space respectively in certain frames although for observers in general it still is a combination of space and time parts so what is space and what is time is kind of mixed up and as we said space time as a whole is the way to go if you want an observer independent perspective but we are yet to talk about the light like space time interval these are of course intervals between events that occur on the trajectory or world lines of a light particle or photon so such intervals are always along the light cones for observers like ourselves in s0 frame and s1 frame and s2 frame any frame light like intervals are always a combination of space and time parts and by the second postulate of special relativity they exactly cancel each other in all frames making them null space time intervals for the photon itself this is a terrible situation really if it could see it would see itself stuck not just at a point in space or at a moment in time but stuck in space time itself sounds pretty wacky right but think about it the total space time interval covered by a photon is always zero by definition so the bottom line is it cannot cover any non zero distance in space time at all note that it is not spatial distance i'm talking here but space time distance all that crazy highest possible universally constant speed that we material observers observe the photons to move with is for us to see but the photons cannot see themselves doing that speed as far as they know they are stuck at a point so for a photon all of the space time is just one point which again is a single unified entity so that's it for this video i hope you have found this perspective of space time as a unified entity interesting do let me know in the comment section if you have and i will see you in the next video bye bye